All right, cool. I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, welcome again to today's webinar, Coursing Through Gaslands. My name is Kevin again. I'm with Halt the Harm Network. We're pleased, as always, to do um, webinars fe featuring the work from Frack Trucker Alliance. If you all have, are not familiar with Frack Trucker's work, I encourage you to go check them out. They have a lot of great resources. They've done a lot of great work on oil and gas impacts, including a lot of their awesome mapping work. Um, I'll drop the link to their website in the chat soon. So you all can go check them out. Today, we have the pleasure of having Matt Kelso, who is their manager of data and technology, and Ted Auk, who is their Great Lakes program coordinator, who are presenting on some of the really interesting and exciting field work on the oil and gas impacts in watersheds and forest, especially around the um, Ohio River Valley region. Uh, this is really important work because a lot of these impacts go unnoticed or uninvestigated, and we really appreciate Frack Tracker Alliance taking the initiative to conduct this kind of field work and reveal these very specific uh, damages caused by especially fracking in these areas. Um, so really excited for today's presentation. So as a reminder, folks, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Give us your name, where you're coming from, uh, what you're looking forward to, to hearing about in regards to impacts on watersheds and forests. Uh, and we'll get started with the presentation. We'll have a Q&A at the end. Feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go along. And when we get to Q&A, you can also um, come off mute and ask your questions, uh, make comments and things like that. So with that, uh, we'll pass it to Matt and Ted and let you all take it away. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm going to set up the uh, the screen share here. So let me know if this seems correct. Sometimes Zoom throws you for a loop. Um, so yeah, we coursing through Gaslands is the title of the project that we uh, worked on in 2022, uh, focused on the Tawanda Creek watershed, and it's one of several uh, watershed-focused programs that we've done in recent years. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our experience with this uh, watershed in particular, and also just in general, um, why we think that uh, looking at uh, oil and gas impacts through the lens of uh, watersheds is is a, a useful tool. So go ahead and go to the next screen here. Okay, so um, Tawanda Creek uh, is um, in the Susquehanna River Basin. You can see it here on the right. Um, it's the area outlined in green and the Susquehanna River Basin is this uh, large area shown uh, with a black outline. Um, the watershed itself is actually composed of two different um, watersheds, the way the way they organize these things. So the one on the bottom here, you can see my um, my yellow cursor here. Uh, the one on the bottom is uh, Schrader Creek, and then up on the top is Tawanda Creek. Uh, so Schrader Creek is a lot more rugged, uh, more uh, hilly, more forested, and Tawanda Creek uh, area on the top has much less as you. Um, public lands and uh, uh, a lot of farmland. So this is what Schrader Creek looks like. Uh, so as you can see, it's very heavily forested. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned here, it has, some, has a rugged charm. Um, this is where there's a lot of um, state game lands. And this is a picture of uh, some farmland on the northern part of the Tawanda. Uh, creek watershed. So here are some statistics for the watershed. Um, so it has 567 miles of uh, designated streams. It comes from a, a data source called uh, designated streams. So that's why it's given that name here. Um, so 373 of those are cold water fishery streams. Five miles are warm water fisheries, 85 miles are designated as exceptional value, and 78 miles as high quality streams. And about 25 miles are um, stocked with trout. There's also quite a few wetlands in the area. So there's 808 freshwater emergent wetlands, uh, 2,119 forested shrub wetlands, and nearly 1,700 riparian wetlands or, or um, streamside wetlands, and then um, a number of uh, lakes and ponds as well. 78% of the area is forested. 
Um, that is uh, significantly more than the United States, which I think is around 56%, and Pennsylvania, which I think is around 67%. So it's significantly more forested than, than either of those. Um, and of that, uh, the area here, uh, Tawanda Creek is 195 square miles. The uh, Schrader Creek is 82 square miles. We have 62 square miles of state game lands and six miles, six square miles of state forest. So obviously this is about uh, fracking and impacts of fracking. Uh, so this is a picture of a well pad near Hatch Spring Road. Um, as you can see, this is a, this is an active pad. And so this is a good segue to talk about the impacts. As you can see, it really started around 2008. There, they had done some exploratory drilling in the watershed before 2008, but that amounted to five wells. Um, since then, there have been 372 wells that have been drilled, and there's 378 more wells that have been proposed but haven't been drilled yet. Those drilled wells have a total of 537 violations issued by the Pennsylvania DEP, so that works out to 1.42 violations per well. And when we're talking about impacts, there's a variety of them, and it's not just not just the fracking pads themselves, um, but there's a whole uh, a whole system of infrastructure that's required to to make this industry work. So here's a picture of just a few of these things. Um, you can see that there's this pipeline receiver um, on the bottom left. Um, it's a it's a pretty uh, sizable structure that comes out of the ground. Um, Taylor compressor station up here. Um, this is one of uh, and two compressor stations in the watershed. Um, and this picture on the bottom is showing impacts to uh, roads. And those impacts include traffic and road degradation. So here we just see um, a couple of water hauling, water hauling trucks. And um, a fracking operation requires thousands of truck trips per well. Um, so you can multiply that by the number of, uh, you know, 370 some wells. And you can see that the uh, oil and gas traffic has become quite common in that part of the state. And uh, water usage is the main issue as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in just a minute. Um, and you can see this is a picture of one of the large water impoundments. Um, there's records of 30 of these in this watershed. And then over here on the right, we have um, a brine uh, tanker. And so wells in this watershed generated 80 million gallons of liquid waste and 54,000 tons of solid waste just in 2021. Um, so the amount of waste that is generated is ongoing and um, just at a scale that a lot of people don't think about. So this is uh, something I wanted to focus in a little bit more on. In the Susquehanna Basin, um, all the well pads have this sign here, this consumptive use sign. And this is the amount of water that they're allowed to use. And in this case, the water that they're allowed to use works out to seven and a half million gallons of water per day on this well pad. And that extends about five years or so, maybe a little longer in this case. So it, it's 2,711 days between um, July 13, 2016 and December 14, 2023. So they're allowed to use seven and a half million gallons of water per day, every day. Um, for that entire duration. Now, do they? Probably not, hopefully not, because that works out to more than 20 billion gallons of uh, fresh water just for this one well pad. Um, but still, you know, the, the amount that they're allowed to use is on that scale. I think that's an important thing for people to realize. Um, go on here. So our project was a field documentation project. We had um, 10 volunteers 
and uh, five staff members. And we all broke into teams and went around the uh, watershed. And there's a couple of special cases that we'll talk about also. Um, but covering a watershed of this size is really, um, it's really challenging in a lot of ways. And you know, there's parts of it that uh, are not accessible um, just because the, the roads, there's closed roads as a factor. Um, and rough roads is another factor. Um, but this is something we couldn't have done without help from the community. So we really are appreciative of that. Um, there's a couple of special cases I wanna talk about here. So uh, David uh, Hanacek, and um, you can correct me if I said that wrong, Ted, um, is a volunteer pilot with uh, Lighthawk, and he he donated his time and use of his aircraft to give us some aerial support. And I think Ted might talk about that a little bit later. Ted uh, rode around with him and and took a lot of pictures and and uh, video footage as well. So um, here you could see there's a number of um, frac pads with their uh, cuts for um, pipelines and access roads in an otherwise uh, forested area that is dotted with um, wetlands. So you can see how it's starting to change the character of the of the watershed. And I'm gonna go ahead and click this. Another um, really interesting uh, tool that we had at our disposal was uh, the Earthworks FLIR optical gas imaging camera, OGI camera. Um, and it's a really cool technology that allows you to see emissions and you can calibrate it to different um, different things. So uh, you know, Melissa would be able to tell you a lot more about it than I could, but the short of it is that as you look at this video, you can see all kinds of emissions through these different um, opti op optimal uh, gas imaging settings that you can't see with the naked eye. So we'll just take a look at this for, for a minute here. Oh yeah, this is of the uh, Taylor compressor station. And I believe, I believe we're looking at methane here. You get the idea of this one, so we'll move on. Um, so this is one of several of these projects that we've done in recent years. Uh, we've done projects in Pine Creek in 2019, Loyal Sock Creek in 2020, uh, Lycoming Creek in 2021, and Tawanda Creek in 2022. We do have plans for 2023 as well. Um, I think there's a, a few things for us to figure out before we make those public, but um, I just think it's really, um, it's been an interesting time in this part of the watershed going back there year after year. Um, is it, you know, being from the Pittsburgh area, that's not a part of the state that I uh, know very well, aside from these, uh, these excursions. So it's been a real learning opportunity for me. And I also wanted to touch on the reaction that we get from industry for these kind of projects. So this is the 2021 project, which was Lycoming, uh, Lycoming Creek. And uh, as you can see, uh, our friends at the Marcellus Drilling News uh, had a, a couple of choice words for us. You know, they, they called Frack Tracker Alliance a, a virulent leftist group that pretends to offer up science, um, but instead offers demonstrably false lies about fracking. And Later on, they say it's a complete fraud and sham financed by big green money. So um, if you want to know what the uh, industry thinks of our work, you know, here you go. Uh, of course, we don't agree with their analysis, um, but we do think that their attack is telling. Um, it seems that these watershed investigations where you're putting a lot of attention on a, uh, on a relatively small geography and the cumulative impacts that are happening there uh, is a real sore spot for them. So uh, we think we're on the right track. 
And uh, so that's it for part one. Um, Ted's going to walk you through part two. And so please stay tuned for that. And let me uh, figure out how to stop sharing. And okay. No. Thanks, Matt. Uh, let me figure out how to start sharing. Uh, okay. Can everyone see that? <clears throat> let me get into slideshow mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming and reiterating what, what Matt said. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad that so many people are interested in this topic. Um, I've been working at Frack Tracker for a, a long time, not as long as Matt, but the whole time I've really been interested in the water energy nexus question. Um, and I'm going to kind of build off of some of what Matt talked about, but I'm going to pivot the geographies and move a little bit towards Ohio and to a lesser degree, Western Virginia, where I've been focusing on some of the, the same questions Matt's been asking and answering in Pennsylvania. Um, we all know if you're on this webinar and you've been following Halt the Harm or following the fracking conversation for many years, you know that the industry and all of its kind of cheerleaders in Washington and state capitals and everywhere else have made a lot of the fracking revolution and energy independence and that kind of thing. But but to my mind, very little attention or, or not enough attention has been paid to three of its most significant costs. Number one would be the impact on the landscape by way of gathering and transmission pipelines, well pads, compressor stations, and some of the infrastructure Matt pointed out. Um, I think that this is an important topic for a variety of reasons. One is I'm really interested in the impacts on wildlife and ecosystems more broadly, but also with respect to watersheds, we know that if you change the surface characteristics of a landscape, you're gonna change the ability of that landscape to capture, store, filter, and uh, you know purify water. So, so you're changing the fundamental hydrologic characteristics of an ecosystem. So that feeds directly into what we're gonna be talking about today. And, and nowhere, there's not a better opportunity to see this kind of stuff in some of those flights that we've doing with our we've done with our uh, partners at Lighthawk. When you get up in the air and you're you know 1500, 800 to 1500 feet above the landscape, and you go above that plateau that Matt showed you, you end up seeing you end up seeing the totality of the landscape impact, and it's huge. And I think that you know the diffuse nature of this industry allows it to get away with a lot of really bad stuff vis-a-vis -vis coal mines, which are these highlighted, you know, you know, mountaintop removals or strip mines that everyone can see from, from, from the air. But this, in, this industry is very, it's far more diffuse in its landscape impacts, but in totality, it's, it's a pretty significant impactor. Uh, number two, the sizable impact of the production of solid brine and waste. That stuff is sloshing around all around the Ohio River Basin. So that is the production of brine, the transport of it, of it through brine trucks and other methods and the disposal of it through very dubious methods like injection wells, wastewater impoundment pits and the like. And the third impact, which is what I'm gonna be focusing on today and Matt's talked about is the documented costs to watersheds of the industry's consumptive water use habit that seems to my mind to be unquenchable based on the data that we've looked at. The watershed approach, as Matt mentioned, is a really proven and very effective way of illustrating this latter point. And as, as, as Matt also pointed out, it seems to be signed at this Achilles heel when you can see the backlash or the the lashing out of the industry against folks like us and others who have pointed this out. Uh, the two watersheds that I'm gonna be focusing on today primarily are in Ohio. One is this really large blob on the Eastern side of Ohio. It's called the Muskingum River watershed. It's an 8,000 square mile watershed in Eastern Ohio. Uh, it's where most of the oil and gas activity has happened in the state of Ohio. It's actually where the oil and gas activity the fracking industry started. And then a smaller watershed, the, the Captina Creek watershed, which is adjacent to the Muskingum watershed, not in it, but still emptying out into the Ohio River around Powhatan Point, Moundsville area, West Virginia, if you know that area. Um, <clears throat> we began looking at the trends in water and waste production back in the summer of uh, 2013, when it became clear that both of these things were increasing at an exponential rate. And if you fast forward to the weeks and months before COVID, um, another kind of another thing began to reveal itself, another trend began to re reveal itself. And what we began to find when we started to merge data sets, data sets around oil and gas production, the length of the laterals, and the amount of water used on a per well basis, we started to see another trend, which was that you saw an industry where resource use inefficiencies uh, were never good and were getting much, much worse at an exponential rate. Um, so that's a really, really concerning thing. And it was, it, 
really did begin to emerge around that time. Um, but we were seeing this exponential rise in water and, and brine production, you know, as early as 2015. And then if you and then if you start to think about some of the cheerleading being done by you know all manner of politicians and industry around petrochemicals, plastics, and carbon capture and storage. What struck me or what, what comes to mind for me is, is this is the downstream infrastructure that we're talking about, but what would these projects, if left to run amok, what would they do upstream of them at the well pad level? And to my mind, what they would do is they would cause an industry, again, to lean heavily on water and waste and lean heavily on very, very inefficient wells or wells that they've already visited and have to go back to so that the inefficiencies would only grow in magnitude. So. We all know also that the industry trumpets year over year increases in gas production or in some places oil production. And that's something that anyone, you know, you can't really refute that. They can obviously generate more and more gas every year and that keeps analysts and lenders and that kind of thing happy. So that's something that is irrefutable. But these year over year increases in, in production come at the, at, at the expense of watersheds and countless environmental impacts. Uh, what you see here, this is a map of Southeastern Ohio and you can see what I'm what I hope that you can see is this northeast to southwest kind of demarcation heading straight through kind of Jefferson County, Noble County, Ohio, where on the northwest side you see, you know, uh, very, very inefficient wells. This is actually where the industry started. You saw quite a bit of brine being produced per unit of gas produced. And then on the southeast side, you see a little bit more, you know, significantly more gas produced than brine produced. But the concerning thing is that if you look at the bottom right hand corner where Belmont and Monroe County are in Ohio, you can see that that brine to gas ratio, that inefficiency ratio is beginning to rear its ugly head yet again. So of course, energy production um, is something that is kind of, you know, it's, we, we can't refute that. You can see here this left hand figure. This is a figure that shows year over year gas production in the state of Ohio. That blue line is the line that the industry likes to tout. That's the headline number that you know, DNR and elected officials talk a lot about. But I'm not really too concerned about that because I don't think that that tells the whole picture. I think the whole picture is told when you start to look at these wells on a production on a per well basis. And that orange line is per well gas production in Ohio. And you can see that line has kind of flatlined and is beginning to decline. And that started back in 2015. So the spread between total gas produced and per well gas produced, that's the spread that they need to make up for. And to my mind, the number one way that they're doing that is leaning heavily on cheap water and cheap waste in states like Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And on the right-hand side, you can see that unlike the left-hand side curve, you can see that these are injection wells in the state of Ohio, and you can see the cumulative and the average well disposal in our injection wells is going up in parallel. So again, this is the two, these are two different trends, but it shows that the spread between total gas production and, and per well gas production is separating well total uh, waste disposal and per well waste disposal is actually staying in, 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 in parallel. So that's those are two trends that are going from the bottom left to the top right over time. And the other two very important trends that are going up in a similar fashion are water demand and the length of the laterals that the industry is deploying to get every last ounce of gas out of the ground. On the, on the left-hand side, you can see average water demand in Ohio going up at an exponential rate. This is a trend that persists in other states. It might not be exponential. It could be linear. It could take a bunch of different shapes. But the fact is that it's, it's, it's going up in other states. So this is not unique to Ohio. Um, and, as a, and in association with that, you also see that the laterals are getting longer, right? What the industry trumpets as super laterals. But to my mind, these aren't super laterals. They're what I'll call super consumers. And I call them that because I like to think of uh, the data says that these super laterals actually on a per linear foot basis are using more resources than the, than the, than the shorter wells that were permitted back in 2010 and 2011. So you have wells that are trying to access the furthest reaches of these gas plays. And in so doing, they're using more and more resources per unit area. So all you take all of that stuff and you combine it and you kind of get what I'm calling this kind of theoretical ratio that I think really gets at the heart of what's going on here. Um, and what it basically says to me is that, yes, we can talk about gas production year over year, and yes, it's increasing. But if you put that number, the headline number, the industry touts in the denominator, and you actually put in the numerator, you put all the stuff needed to get that gas out of the ground in the numerator, and you look at it from a ratio standpoint, you see a far more disturbing picture. 
you see a disturbing picture where the inefficiencies that were running rampant through the industry have only gotten worse. And to my mind, when you look at this industry in that way, rather than just in a simplistic fashion, you see a far more disturbing picture. And here in Ohio, we just, we just uh, Governor DeWine just decided that natural gas is a green form of energy. And he was able to do that. He was able to say that kind of thing because he's gotten a lot of, he's gotten pass, he's gotten passes, he's gotten coverage from industry and some of their partners in greenwashing natural gas. And they've done that by being very simplistic in how they look at it. They just say that if you can keep methane at a certain level vis-a-vis -vis gas production, that this is a green form of energy. But to my mind, it's very, it's way more complicated than that. And if we looked at it in this manner, I think that we would see that there's really no such thing as green gas, green natural gas. So the other thing to point out is, you know, is we talked a lot about resource inefficiencies, but what I want to talk about quite simply is, is water demand in total. And I've been working with a partner named Gary Allison down in Columbus. He's a really, he's a data whiz. He's a great guy. And we've been working to try to understand some of the data and the frac focus data, cleaning it up and the like. And so we've taken this data and we've kind of looked at it across watersheds, across states. And, and I'm going to highlight a couple of numbers here and we'll kind of go through these slides um, as quick as we can. But the, the, the points of these of these slides are that water demand, as you take the geographies and you move from the macro, that is national, and you move to the micro, which is the Captina Creek, you're going to see a trend coming. So overall, uh, all the wells that we've looked at in this data set, the wells have used about 6.4 million gallons per well. In the Ohio River Basin states, those wells, uh, the fracked wells use about 9.8 million gallons per well. Of those 16,000 wells, 11,000 are actually in the river basin itself, and they use about 11.1 .1 million gallons per well. Now let's narrow this, this kind of, let's narrow this geography a little bit further into this Muskingum watershed that I talked about. There's about 1,400 wells in the Muskingum watershed. And again, this is data that we've compiled. This is a little bit old. This is probably, you know, at least a couple quarters old, but I, I don't think that this is gonna be, it's not that out of date with regard to the trends. Um, <clears throat> So 1,400 wells in the Muskingum watershed, and those wells use about 12.0 12 uh, 12 million gallons of water per frac. Now, that is, that is very disturbing because this, I'll get to you in a minute why this is happening in Muskingum specifically. But what's also disturbing is the lacks, is, is the gap in the data quality and data quantity. So for the data that we've looked at, We've done some estimates trying to look at what the gap might actually be in total water versus what we know of is being used. And for Ohio, we think that the gap in water demand is underestimated by about 25%. And we get to this calculation with a quick and dirty back of the envelope where we take the total number of wells drilled in any given state. We take the wells that were reporting frac um, water at that point, and we take that difference and we multiply it by the state average. And we get this what I'll call total water use estimate. I think that's conservative at best because I think that we're not capturing some of those, the later water demand upticks that, that we know are occurring. Um, so now if you take that and you narrow it even further down to this 200 plus square mile sub watershed in Southeast Ohio that empties out the, into the Ohio River, you get the Captina Creek watershed. And this is an interesting watershed and it's, come, it's kind of near and dear to my heart because it's where the, um, one of the only thriving populations of the hellbender salamander is in Ohio. It's one of the most you know, pristine forested watersheds in the state of Ohio. And you can see here, it's also replete with uh, fracked wells, uh, natural gas pipelines, and all manner of other infrastructure. So the hellbender sal salamander is, is a, a charismatic species that, that uh, is, you know, it's a threatened species, and it's really kind of on the, it's on the brink. And there's a lot of other critters that live in this system that are on the brink, not just because of water, but also because of the gathering pipelines that are all throughout this watershed. But to the point of this talk, um, these wells are using these wells are using in the Captina Creek. They're using about 17 million gallons of water per fracked well in the Captina Creek watershed, which is 2.6 times the national average. So we know that where water is a plenty and water is priced accordingly, they're going to use more water because they need more water because they're getting desperate and because they know that if they ramp up water demand, gas is going to come out come hell or high water. Um, so. This, that's Ohio, but Pennsylvania is no worse. As a matter of fact, the underestimate in Pennsylvania I'm, I'm, I've come to is about 36%. So, you know, this really speaks to a lack, in data, a lack of data availability at a time when we really need it, especially when we know that climate change is dramatically altering watershed hydrology and that kind of thing. And then West Virginia. West Virginia is probably the worst of the worst. 
uh, to my mind, West Virginia, with, when it comes to fracking, is a black box. I mean, there's so little we know about West Virginia with regard to fracking. And the, and the underestimate in water demand for West Virginia, I'm going to say, is somewhere around 265%, right? So we really know very little in a state that relies so much on water. It's such a beautiful state, but it's um, really handing over water. And we don't really know about the economics of water in West Virginia as well. There's also something to be said for water withdrawal sites throughout the region. Uh, in the state of Ohio, 286 of our water withdrawal sites are in that Muskingum watershed. Uh, in Pennsylvania, a significant number of them are in the Ohio River Basin. Uh, this water withdrawal site uh, map that you can see in Ohio, um, it's unfortunate because the, the, the permitting process in Ohio vis-a-vis -vis what Matt was talking about in Pennsylvania is such that if you can maintain 2 million gallons or less on a 30-day period, you don't have to apply for a consumptive water use permit in Ohio. So the industry has gamed the system by spreading out their demand over a larger area and more sites. But the heart of it all is money, right? Well, the heart of it all said, and the signal being sent to the industry by the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District, which, sell, which sells water to the industry, they've been sending the wrong signal to the industry over time. And we've been looking at this with partners like Leah Harper and, and some others who have been doing even more groundbreaking work than, than we have on MWCD. But anyway, the point is, is that MWCD sold water to Gulfport back in 2012 for $9 per thousand gallons. 2014, they went back to Gulfport for $6, and, uh, $6 per thousand gallons. And mostly recently to EAP for $3 per thousand gallons. Uh, that, that translates to about 0.25 to 0.75% of well pad costs. And you can look at it in your own household. If you have something that you're only spending 0.25% of your, your income on, you're not really worried about it. And as a matter of fact, you probably don't think twice about it. And that's the same thing with the industry. They know that the water is going to generate gas. It's priced accordingly, and they're going to keep on using it. So we're sending the wrong signal. The costs are far from prohibitive and actually, as I said, sending the wrong signal to industry and all of its forms. That is to say, all the infrastructure involved in this whole thing. And no matter how you do the math, however coarse it is, however granular it is, you're probably not going to get over 1% for costs of water and waste, um, no matter how you do it. Um, so this is a real concern. Again, it, the, the signal is not being sent to the industry to be a more responsible actor. As a matter of fact, we're sending a signal to the industry to use all the water that they might possibly need or con conceive of needing because we view water, whether it's MWCD, the state of Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, we view water as kind of this fungible commodity that can be priced accordingly and that we can profiteer off of. But we know that market forces should dictate that, and we have an industry that talks about market forces all the time. We know the market forces should dictate that uh, something that they need that bad that we have should be priced in such a way that meets those, those, those principles. But we're going in the other direction. We're saying the number one thing they need to do what they do, water and waste, we're gonna keep dropping the price on. That makes absolutely no sense. So in summary, um, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, the economics, ease of access and growing inefficiencies across the fracking and petrochemical landscape in the Ohio River Valley have been concerning and those concerns continue to grow. The gaps in the water supply demand data throughout the Ohio River Valley vary by state, but critical voids have been demonstrated throughout the region, and they continue to grow as well. It is clear in the data that inefficiencies within the industry were never good and have grown worse at an exponential rate. And finally, water and waste needs to be priced more holistically and with an eye towards incorporating any and all long-term environmental hydrological costs. You know, to my mind, when you think about some of the natural disasters going on throughout this world, throughout this country, Eventually those people, whether it's California or all the way to Florida, are gonna to have to move someplace where climate change is not you know, running amok on them. And they're probably gonna to come to places like this because the water that we have is, is so plentiful. But if we keep treating water in such a way that we treat it across the Ohio River Basin for fracking and other industries, we might not have as much of it as we, as we had hoped. So it's a real big concern for mine. And um, you know, with that, I will kind of uh, wrap it up and thank you for your time. Thanks, Matt and Ted. Really appreciate the presentations. <clears throat> they're very, um, they're super informative, and I definitely learned a lot. Uh, we still have a good amount of time left, so which gives us an uh, excellent opportunity to have um, discussion. So we're going to open up to Q and A. Um, invite folks to drop their questions in the chat or raise your hand using the raise hand function on Zoom. 
if you're unable to do either of those things, don't worry, you can come off mute and uh, I'll recognize your questions. But I'll start, there are a couple of questions in the chat um, that no matter, Ted, if, if you wanna take them. Shelly from Idaho was asking, how do we know how much water they're using on these wells? Um, and should we be privy to that info? Should it be public record? And it looks like based on Ted's presentation, that varies quite a bit state to state, you know, looking at West Virginia versus others. But if either of you guys wanna take on that question. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go ahead. Okay. Most states uh, require a disclosure <laughs> of what goes into the well. Uh, in, in there's a national registry called Frac Focus. Um, this is self-disclosed data, so there's not a lot of oversight over the accuracy of it. And uh, it shows because when you look at the data, you'll see some obviously ridiculous numbers, like you know. 300 million gallons of water for one single well, or, um, you know, perhaps they'll claim zero water at all. Um, so there's a lot of anomalies, but they are supposed to uh, disclose it uh, to frag focus. And I think most, if not all states require that now. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we also have a question from John Sonnen. Will, property, will properly pricing water not reinforce the trend towards privatizing. Who's privatizing what? Water sourcing? John? Yeah, that's water. I'm wondering if that's not going to uh, make it more uh, uh, appropriate to capitalize water in general. Right. No, that's a good question. I mean, I know that I mean, there's places where I know there's places in North Dakota and other states where water speculation is is kind of what you're talking about too. Is like that's definitely a big part of it for sure. So you know, yeah. I mean, when you unleash the the, the forces that you're talking about, that that is the dark side of the whole thing. So I, I'm not saying that this. What I'm saying about pricing water over time is not you know it's not a panacea. But at this point, the downward trend in water pricing is is has to stop. And then when you're talking about the privatization thing, that's for sure something that would have to be addressed, but that's that's adjacent to it for sure. I also wanna recognize Joanne Hackos uh, comments. She's from Sierra Club in Colorado, uh, talking about how oil and, glass company, oil and gas companies can buy water from municipalities and counties and how they're very willing to sell it. She also mentioned that uh, they can keep their water sources secret in Colorado, which is um, depressing to hear about. We did a whole, webinar series about water issues in Colorado this last spring and encourage folks to check it out. Drop a link in the chat. Joanne, did you want to come on and say something? Yeah, we're really, uh, we're discouraged because the legislature won't take it on in the new session that started this past week. Um, they're saying that um, it's up to the towns and counties. It's their decision to make. Uh, we're not, they're not going to do anything about any kind of uh, state level rules at all. So it's really discouraging. We can't get anywhere with it. Uh, and they're building now they're, you know, we've got 115 wells being proposed a quarter mile from a major reservoir. Discouraging. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, think the, I, I was going to say, I, I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've been looking at trying to, I've been trying to dig into some of these states as to pricing regimes for water for the industry. And it it varies from anecdotal to non-existent and then, you know, somewhere in between. So it's, I mean, I've been, we've been fortunate. And again, this is, Leah Harper has been really helpful in this is like kind of pinpointing, narrowing in on this MWCD specifically. That's one of the only times I've ever seen that level of understanding. I have seen numbers you know, for some of the desal plants in Texas that they're proposing where it's somewhere around, you know, I, I think it's even less, it's, it's, it's somewhere like $2.25 per thousand gallons. So very hard to pin down those numbers for sure. Yeah, the desal issue in Texas is a good one to, to bring up for sure. Um, Natasha, I see you have your hand raised. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, you're still on mute. Hi, thanks so much, Ted, for the great uh, presentation. I was wondering how recycled water calculates into um, your analysis, if at all. 
I mean, I'll just speak for myself. Um, I've, I looked at the recycled thing in, in, again, only in those two states, Ohio and West Virginia, and the level of recycling actually, and I haven't, but I have not looked at this data in at least a year and a half. But um, at that point, it was going down from a really low bar, the level of water that was actually being recycled. And I think, and again, I can't prove this, but I think the reason is because the price of actual water is going down. So there's no impetus being put on using that, the, the potential, you know, R&D associated with that as a, as a way to avoid the water demand. So um, it was going down from a really low bar. Um, but again, I haven't looked at the data recently, but um, yeah, so. And, and then just out of curiosity in the areas that you did look at, are there any um, restrictions on withdrawal of water from those um, rivers or waterways um, to protect um, fish and wildlife? I mean, we yeah, like so that so the consumptive water use permit invokes at two million gallons per day over a 30 day period, anything over that you have to get that permit. And that's a lot some of the natural gas, some of the processing plants and that that image I showed in that one slide was a, a cracker plant that was proposed for Powhatan Point or Dealey's Bottom, Ohio. They have to get those consumptive water use permits. Um, but you know, there is anecdotal evidence, and I I'm inclined to believe it, that says that, you know, there's often instances where these guys and gals just takes take a pump when they're when they need more water and they just go into some headwater stream and just fill up when it when they're, you know, when they need more water. And that that actually bears out in the data because if you look at the amount of water that's documented in Ohio, you know, the water, the, the data that I'm showing, if you look at that data, you find that there's a gap in the amount of water consumed and the water removed. And that gap can be upwards of 15 to 20%, which tells us that there's 15 to 20% of the water demand is unaccounted for, which is very disturbing, but that varies by state too. Thanks, thanks for that. I could I could add to that. We we've got evidence of um, pumping uh, outside of the uh, well pad. We filed a complaint because a pumping station was put up under a an active bald eagle nest, and um, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission decided that um, they couldn't do anything about stopping the pumping or defending the eagle nest. Uh, because it was outside the pattern was outside their jurisdiction. Crazy. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, I see, I see some questions in the chat. There's a bit of a doozy from Steve Wilson, which I'll, I'll read out. As a list, what are the main talking points around how fracking is not governed by traditional market forces like every other industry except for agriculture? I don't know if that's a question either of you guys want to address at all because it's a kind of a giant one. I mean, there there are a lot of important aspects to that, and and I'll just touch on it a little bit. Maybe Ted has some thoughts too. Um, but obviously it's true. I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh you know, different governmental entities that are propping up this, this industry. Um, many of these companies would have gone under uh, in normal uh, market force situations, uh, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, all of these, all of these companies were losing, uh, you know, billions of dollars per year. Um, so without the uh, generous support of taxpayer dollars. Uh, I don't think it would be possible to have an industry that's this expansive. Yeah, I can't add anything to that. I think that's well said. Um, next question, I think Dee Swinson has a question that we, we all wish we knew the answer to, but she's asking, or he or she is asking, what is the specific composition of frack waste and brine? Yeah, I I mean that your answer is correct. I mean the this the sample size is small. I mean I know Justin Noble's done some really good work on this, exposing what's in this stuff. Um, anecdotally, we know that it can be really hot, really radioactive, um, but it's benignly called salt water. You know that we can all drink, and you know is nothing worse than your local estuary. So, um, yeah, I mean way more work needs to be done with that. Um, 
And it speaks to nothing, you know, it says nothing about actually the other component that Matt talked about, which is like, we're talking a lot about the liquid stuff, but there's also a whole bunch of solid waste going everywhere. And that stuff has water in it too. And that stuff leaks out and a state like Ohio is really horrible at monitoring the leachate coming out of landfills that take in radioactive, potentially radioactive waste. They, ha they have no requirement. And these are landfills with a lot of people around them. So it's, yeah, I mean, there's a real gap there. So you've hit a primary gap. Yeah, it's one of the great industry secrets we wish we all knew the answer to. Um, that would be a great law to be introduced to requiring them to actually reveal that. Um, I, I see Kathy Martin, you put a couple of comments in the, the chat about, said mentioned that some states own the groundwater like New Mexico, others the landowners, and you also had some other interesting things to add to it. Would you want to come off mute and talk a little bit about some of the things you mentioned? Let me put my video on. <laughs> uh, yeah, hi guys. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with the dog and the, the oil and gas boys. They are just an amazing group of people. So uh, I was just going to make a comment on the 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 produced water. Back, oh, it's been several years now when I was working with Maria Payan and John and all those guys in PA that a lot of the, the produced water was being used to, um, you know, for salt, salting the roads in the winter. In fact, I was surprised that New York State, 100% of their brine of course, there's no fracking there, but 100% of their brine uh, water is used for uh, deep salting the roads in the winter, just so you know. So, and then I forgot what your question was because I had to say that. <laughs> uh, so, you, you asked about water usage. Is that what you're saying in Oklahoma? No, I just thought you put a comment about different states have different water rules about who owns oh, it. So, if you yeah. wanted to expand on it, just welcome to you too. But don't worry if you want to. No, absolutely. Sorry, I just had to have my brain switched back on. Every state has, you know, water law, and it, that alone, you know, is a, a lifetime study. And so when you're talking about, especially groundwater or surface water, you know, it's each, some states are use it or lose it. Uh, for surface water, uh, there, there is some accommodation for downstream users, but it's first come, first serve. You have to look at you know at the exact rule in your state. Uh, a lot of water, like I worked in some cases in Nevada where the water was originally allocated back, you know, a hundred years ago for mining operations, and those rights have just been sold and and passed on to people, and it's just been captured for you know a century. Uh, other states have um, you know an annual you know permitting program. Oklahoma has that for for groundwater withdrawal. And they have different uh, categories of users, obviously domestic, agriculture, industrial, et cetera. And those types of permitting programs that have potential for public comment and public hearing. So there is some uh, method you know, that, that, that you could interact and maybe try to stop some of the withdrawal. Good luck to that. Anyway, those were my thoughts. Well, thank you, Kathy. I appreciate you sharing them. Um, we have a question from Jim in the chat too. What is the method of brine disposal in Ohio? So, uh, so yeah, that figure that I showed you <clears throat> at the beginning, or maybe quarter of the way through, was um, was for um, injection wells, class two injection wells, saltwater disposal wells. We have you know two hundred forty five, two hundred fifty of them in Ohio, uh, which pales in comparison to some of these other bigger states like Oklahoma and Kansas, with you know. 8,000, 9,000 plus injection wells. We all know what's going on in Oklahoma with seismic activity. So, so yeah, so we have these wells that take in a lot of waste from the other two states, a lot of waste that's generated south. Um, what's interesting about the injection wells is they're oftentimes, they actually, in, they're actually around, they, they, they're in places where the fracking is actually not happening. So actually in different parts of the state. And they're injecting this brine deep into the, you know, sandstone formations all across Ohio. Um, and um, to my mind, you know, the injection well part is, you know, there's people in Ohio, um, Jim, who have been working a lot on this very topic because everyone, most folks that pay any attention to fracking in Ohio know that the state of Ohio should not have primacy over its injection wells. So they're fighting that effort to try to get primacy to go back to the US EPA. 
uh, which I think is a tremendous fight and worth, you know, I think it's just fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, so these injection wells are where a lot of that brine goes. But then the other thing is, is, you know, we also do have wastewater impoundment pits. We don't have many in Ohio. I don't know, maybe Matt could speak about Pennsylvania. I know West Virginia has a couple hundred or did have a couple hundred where you just dump the water into these line pits and you hope most of it dissolves. I mean, uh, you know, just goes up into the atmosphere and it, and, and you dilute the whole thing. But, um, but yeah, that's another way to dispose of it is the wastewater impoundment pits, which is comes with its own, you know, huge issues for sure. Yeah, as as for Pennsylvania, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, I know that there is a lot of uh, water recycling. I don't believe it factors into the uh, water figures that Ted was talking about before. Um, I think that's that's a, a separate item on the on the list um, from from the fresh water that's used in these wells. Um, I know that Pennsylvania tried a long time ago to treat this water on the surface uh, and um, then the, the the effluent from those treatment sites went into the streams and rivers and then uh, industry started complaining other industries the steel industry started complaining because the rivers were too contaminated for their purposes so um, that was a that was a that was no good um, so Pennsylvania is trying to pivot toward more and more injection well usage um, for disposal. There's, there's there's a limit to how much it can be recycled. And when you do recycle it, there's a side uh, issue of the contaminant load gets higher and higher. Uh, so that's, a, that's another factor too. So there's really no good solutions with waste other than to stop drilling. Hey, Ralph, I see you have your hand raised. I think you're still on mute. I'm, I'm on mute. Yeah, sorry. I uh, couldn't figure out how to raise your hand. But uh, the uh, yeah, you guys are right on with the with the um, problem with uh, recycling. We had about five facilities in our town alone uh, recycling for a while. But uh, because we had to, we don't have injection wells. The reason we don't have them is because, luckily for us, there's a lot of gas storage in this area. Um, underground and in the formations that would be normally uh, used for injection wells so they can't put it here so you have to take it all the way to Ohio it's over a 400 mile round trip and it just became I think they couldn't make any money at it there was one company that huh, had a much uh, more strict process of, of uh, an expensive process of, of getting uh, of filtering the water but it was doing things like selling salt for swimming pools and you know that didn't go over too well when people found out where it came from and then uh and they tried uh extracting lithium and i think they're still trying to do it but they had an explosion at the site that did that so it's really a you know again ted hit it i mean the water's cheap and uh that's probably why there's less recycling yeah can i just say um too, I think the other, you know, elephant in the room, as I mentioned, is carbon capture and storage. What does that mean for like enhanced soil recovery and all this other nonsense that kind of comes along with these kind of boondoggles? So it, I, I mean, we've talked about this. I'm sure every, many of you on this webinar have thought about it, but the velocity at which carbon capture and storage is being pushed and advocated for by all manner of people is really disturbing. And what it means for what you just said, Ralph, and what we've been talking about is like even more so. So yeah, the, the, that is really the thing to me that bothers me is like, just when you felt like maybe you had them cornered, they get another lifeline to Stiv's question about like, you know, bailouts and, you know, market forces. Just when you think it's, you know, it's, they get the ultimate prop up in CCS, so. Yeah, and Joanne mentioned in the chat that uh, oil and gas companies in Colorado won't use recycled water because it's so cheap. Uh, because it costs too much to truck, sorry, because it costs too much to truck it to the pads. And so therefore it's cheaper to use fresh non-recycled water. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just mention I see I see Charles Hall said something about good to know for various watersheds what the extraction rate is relative to the rain relative to uh, inputs annually and over low flow periods. And I think that's a great question. And and I think that's something that like, for example, I know in Ohio. Soil and water conservation districts in Ohio that are within that Muskingum watershed I mentioned to you are extremely concerned about that question. Has that mass balance question been asked and it hasn't been? So, 
you're you're spot on with that question and it's it's you know it's definitely one that needs to be asked because that's that's one they really would run from run from excuse me yeah and and especially for the western states where precipitation right. is not as high exactly awesome thanks guys um I saw some with a hand up, but uh, one question I want to ask you guys is what's next for the field work? What kind of your next projects when you're going with this research first? And then second, um, how can folks keep up with it or plug into it? Um, I don't know if our uh, next project is finalized or not. Um, so we'll, we'll sort of uh, keep it a keep it under wraps until it is, I suppose. Uh, but we are planning to have another uh, watershed based uh, uh excursion this year and uh, if you are interested in participating in that it'll probably be closer to um, the western Pennsylvania area and the Ohio River Basin this year so um, if you're interested in participating in something like that um, reach out I think my my email is on it's at least on the slides but um, you re reach out and we can uh, set that in motion um I was just going to say that I'm <clears throat> I'm really interested in digging deep into this stuff in West Virginia because I think it's just flown over way too often. Um, and then the other thing is is looking in different geographies, like Matt mentioned, water stress places. I'm really interested in these questions in North Dakota, where brine is actually being transported by pipeline and what that means, and it's being spread all over the place, and what that means for the actual for agriculture and that kind of thing. And then finally. Like I mentioned earlier, the the desal plants in, in south, south southern Texas, I'm really interested in kind of what that means for those those systems and that kind of thing, and just the economics of it. So, yeah, those are all super important questions. I used to work with an organization in Texas that was involved in fighting those desal plants plants in Corpus Christi and nearby. But yeah, those are terrible. What they're going to do to the ocean? Yeah, out there. Um, oh, great. Uh, we have about two minutes left. We've got enough time for one more question, if anyone has one. See, Pat, you come off mute. Do you want to ask a quick question and close this out? Sorry. Um, was this recorded? Oh, yeah. This it's been recorded. I'll send it out um, potentially later today, but by tomorrow, I'll email it out to everyone. Oh, thank you very much, everybody who's speaking so quickly and with all the things on screen you can't read and listen at the same time, so it was really hard to try to follow. Thank you. No, I appreciate that input, Pat. Thanks. That's where really like to send out the recordings. Uh, you can also enable uh, closed captioning and transcript, too, uh, if that helps during the presentations, um, which we try to do on these calls, so I'm going to do that next time. It helped with the reports are written so you can send it out email to all us. <laughs> thank you yeah no problem thanks for joining um well yeah thanks everyone thanks matt and ted for those awesome presentations thanks to all the great work you do um and to frack tracker alliance in general for everything you do um and thanks everyone else for joining us i really appreciate it i'll send the recording out um and yeah uh dropped a bunch of links in the chat i'll try to send a good portion of the chat out as well since that's some good information in it um and yeah thanks we'll see you at the next webinar um everyone have a great rest of their day